Praise God this morning. I love that song, Let It Rise. Um, Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. The body of Christ and the faith in Christ is about lifting people up, not about bringing people down. And any ministry that claims to represent Jesus, it ought to be about lifting people up. And you don't have to tear other folk down to lift up Christ. And we just thank God for being able to be here with you this morning. Thank you for being with us and all those who've been a part of this worship service. And as we said before, don't just watch us, worship with us. And we're just so thankful. Turn your Bibles, if you will, to the book of Luke. The book of Luke chapter 24. And then we will begin reading a few verses from verse 13 of Luke chapter 24. And I just believe God gave us this this morning, that somebody needs this this morning. And as we share from what the Lord says this morning, verse 13. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. And they were kept, but they were kept from recognizing him. I wanna just talk a little bit from the subject, the seven mile journey still more work to do when my children were younger we brought a car from a particular it was a particular model of car brand from a particular dealership and we had bought a car from them before and had bragged to people about it and had really let people know that we were really satisfied with it and so we got a new car from them again but a couple of months after we received, got the car and we were driving, the car had a major problem. In fact, that was a fire where it started smoking. And when we took it back to that dealership, that, that, that place that we had bragged about, uh, basically after some discussion and they looked at it, basically they said to us, uh, that's your problem. And uh, needless to say, we were very disappointed. We just thought that they would come through better than that. We just expected more out of them, and we had unmet expectations. But you know, it's one thing when a company lets you down, or people let you down, or they don't come through. But how do you respond when it looks like God didn't come through? How do you deal with the fact that you have expectations from God? And it seems like he, he let you down. You still love the Lord. But he just seems like he didn't come through. Uh, shortly after I became the minister here at this church, uh, about 25 years ago, a little bit over, there was a young man at this church, just a wonderful young man in his 20s, a late 20s, just a, just a great guy. He, a wonderful father, wonderful husband, faithful here every Sunday. He would greet me with a smile after the service. And uh, he had some surgery done, but it was elective surgery. Uh, it wasn't supposedly very serious. And so he went into the hospital. And when he went into the hospital uh, for the surgery, he didn't come out of the anesthesia. He remained unconscious. And when he did, uh, when that happened, the doctor said, well, he's going to come out of it. He's going to come out of it. But then as time moved on, the doctor said, well, with some people, it takes time to come out of it. But he's going to come out of it. But then after a couple of days, they said, we don't know why he hasn't come out of it. And then as the family gathered and we prayed, they shared with the family, he may not come out of it. And then finally they said, he is not coming out of it. He will not regain consciousness, and we lost him. I believe during the crucifixion of Jesus, his disciples went through something very similar to this. When Jesus was initially arrested and taken into custody, many of his disciples said, he's going to come out of this. 
And you know why they said that? Because he had done it before. If you remember in Luke chapter 4, when Jesus, three years earlier, when Jesus had began his ministry, he went to the synagogue. And the synagogue worship was a lot like our worship. They would start off a service with a prayer, and then uh, they would actually do a song, and then they would have one of the young men to read a scripture, and then do a short sermon. Well, this Sabbath, it was Jesus' time, and this was his hometown. This was hometown in Nazareth. Well, Jesus went to Isaiah 61, that powerful passage where Isaiah said predictively, prophetically, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. And he said, God has called me to preach good news to the poor. God has called me to preach freedom to those who are in bondage. The blind will get receive their sight. The oppressed will receive freedom. This is the year of the favor of the Lord. <clears throat> and then Jesus said, that's talking about me. He was in his hometown. The people said, yay, that's great. But then he said something else. He said, all those blessings that I just talked about, God is offering those blessings to people who are of a different race than you Jews and a different religion. When he said that, it was on. Because they always believed the only group of folk who could get to God were people who were just like them. And when he said grace is offered to other folk who are not like you, they say you got to get up out of here. And they kicked him out of the synagogue. They took him to a cliff to throw him over a cliff after they kicked him out of the synagogue. By the way, I tell young preachers, you don't, you're not ready to preach until you've been kicked out of something. Until you've been rejected. And they kicked him out. And, and when they got ready to throw Jesus over a cliff, and this was his own hometown, and he had predicted that you guys are going to reject the, the gospel and uh, other folk will receive it. They got ready to throw Jesus over a cliff and Jesus just simply walked through the crowd. Well, his disciples knew that. And so when they arrested Jesus this time, they said he's going to come out of it. He's going to get away. In fact, I believe that's why Judas did what he did. Judas knew that Jesus had power to come out of anything. So Judas said, you know what? I tell you what, I'll get my 30 pieces of silver. Jesus will escape. I get paid. He get away. No harm, no foul. And so when he saw Jesus did not escape, then, of course, Judas wound up taking his own life. But his disciples initially said he's going to get out of this. He's going to get out of this. And then, though, as the time went on and he went through those trials, remember, Jesus went through six trials, three Jewish trials, three Roman trials. He first went before Annas, which was the previous high priest, went to his house, a secret midnight kangaroo court. Then he went to Caiaphas, who was the son-in-law of Annas and who was the current high priest. And then the third Jewish trial was before the whole jury called the Sanhedrin. And then he went through the Roman trials, the secular trials. He went before Pilate because Pilate was the governor of Judea. Jerusalem was a city in Judea. But then when Pilate found out that Jesus was actually born in Galilee in a city, that his, his, he grew up in a city called Nazareth in Galilee where Herod was the governor of Galilee. And it's just like Houston is in Harris County. It, Austin is in Travis County. Well, when Pilate found out that Jesus grew up in Nazareth, which was in Galilee, and Herod was the governor, well, then he sent Jesus to Herod. That was the second trial. Herod then sent him back to Pilate. That's the third trial. What was interesting is this. All three Jewish trials found Jesus guilty. All three Roman trials said he's not guilty. As he went through those trials, his disciples were looking. He's going to come out of this. But then as he carried, hit that cross beam of the cross down that road, that rugged road where that African, where that African man had to help him. As they watched that, they say, hmm, I would have thought he would have gotten out of this by now. And then when the Romans took him and they beat him and they spit on him, they said, we don't know if he's going to come out of this. And then by the time they nailed the nails through his hand, his disciples said, he's not going to come out of this. When you've been let down, sometimes we do several things. Number one, we want to move away from the place of pain. We want to get away from the place or the people that cause us pain. That's avoidance. We want to avoid the triggers. And we're going to see in this story there are two men who's going to walk away from Jerusalem because 
Jerusalem was full of triggers. Every time they would go into Jerusalem, they would see that hill called Golgotha because Golgotha was on the road going into Jerusalem. The Bible said that were passers by. So every time they saw it, it would remind them of the pain. Every time they would go in and see that road Jesus carried, that cross beam for the cross, that would be a trigger for that disappointment. Sometimes when we've been let down, we want to move away from the pain and the triggers. And we want to stay away from the people who cause the pain and even the place. The second thing is we do, we, it is hard to maintain our hope in the promises. In fact, if you look at the text in uh, Luke chapter 24, the Bible says in verse 21, later on they were discussing, they said, we had hope that he was the one. When you've been let down, not only do you want to avoid the triggers that triggers the pain, but you lose hope in the other promises. And then lastly, and you're going to see right here, it is difficult to see the manifestation of his presence. And the Bible says, and the Bible says that in this text, there were two men. One was named Cleopas and one uh, was unnamed. That unnamed person could be any of us. The Bible said that they were walking and they were walking away from Jerusalem and they were talking about all the stuff that had happened. This was the first day of the week. This was the first day of the week. Now, Jesus had come up from the tomb. The angels had, had been sitting on the stone. The women had gone to the tomb. They were startled. The, the angels had announced that Jesus had risen. All this had happened on the first day of the week. The women had told the apostles and all that stuff had gone on on the first day of the week over there. But these two were in a different place and they didn't know all that stuff that had happened yet. They were they were not first hand eyewitnesses to all that stuff and so they were walking leaving Jerusalem remember Jerusalem means place of peace Jerusalem is where grace was they were leaving Jerusalem and they were talking about all that had happened and remember they were downcast they said it is over and they started asking questions why didn't he fight back why did he let Pilate push him around like that when they were lying on him during all those trials, why did he just stood, stand there and keep his mouth closed? Why didn't he respond when those people were lying on him? They were talking about all that. Why didn't his 12 closest disciples defend him? Why? They were asking all those questions as they were talking about what had happened. And maybe you're here right now and you're asking questions. Why wasn't my daddy there for me? Why did she walk out on me? Why did he cheat on me like that? Why don't my children appreciate me? Why do my children disrespect me? Why did they fire me from that job hard as I work for those people? Why do people treat me like this? Maybe you're asking why and you're asking questions about what has happened in your life that you feel like God didn't come through. And the Bible said, as they were walking and they were going to this place called Emmaus, they're going to find out that God didn't bring you this far to leave you. And I want to tell somebody right now, wherever you are right now on your walk, God did not bring you this far to leave you. And here's the thing. They were walking away from that place of promise. Now, I used to ask this question. When we are in a dark place, when we are struggling, I used to believe everything was dependent on what we do. How do we respond? Do we pray? Do we stay faithful? But here's what I've learned. That when you're in a dark, difficult place, how it comes out, it's not based on what you do. The question is, what does God do? What does God do? And watch what God does in this situation. And by the way, God didn't bring you this far. Philippians 1 and 6 says, he who began a good work in you, he will complete it. He is the author and the finisher. Let me tell somebody, if God started something in you, no devil out of hell can block what God is doing. No man who dislikes you, no lie, nothing can stop what God has for you because he who began a good work in you, God finishes what he starts. Somebody say, don't start none, won't be none. God said, I will start it and I'll finish it. And so look what God does. They are going to see something here. They're going to see God in 3D, three dimensions. 
Somebody said, what are you talking about? You don't know what God looks like till you see him in your detours, dead ends, and doubts. That's seeing God in 3D. Some of us have a one-dimensional God. If we do good, God will bless us. That's a one-dimensional God. A two-dimensional God. Well, if we do good, God will bless us. If we do wrong and turn around and act right, God will forgive us. That's a two-dimensional God. But I'm talking about God in 3D. When you so jacked up, you so confused, you don't know what's going on, your eyes are red, you confused, folk have hurt you, the folk you thought were for you or against you, the folk you thought were against you or for you, your world is turned upside down, you can't tell night from day, you can't sleep at night, you all jacked up and God still shows up and you thought you about to lose your mind but God shows up in 3D three dimensional so what God did watch what God does now let's look at what God does we know they all messed up first of all God showed himself Luke 24 and verse 15, as they were walking along the road, talking about how God let them down. Guess who shows up? You know, Jesus has a sense of humor. He showed up, and of course we're going to see they didn't recognize, but, but he said, what y'all talking about? What y'all talking about? You know, what's going on? And here's what I love about this. I used to think that grace was all about when we get ourselves together and we're going towards God, God walks with us, holds us up, and that is grace. But let me tell you what grace is. Grace is when you're going the wrong way, with the wrong thoughts, with the wrong people, doing the wrong thing, with the wrong kind of talk, and God still shows up. And he still shows up. God could, Jesus could have said with his arms folded and said, they all messed up. Forget about them. If they don't get it by now, how are they going to get it? But in the midst of going the wrong way, he still shows up. He met the woman at the well. She was not just going the wrong way because uh, that's where she was. But it wasn't just she was going the wrong way physically. She was going the wrong way in her life relationally. The woman had five husbands. And he said, the man that you got, you took that man from another woman and you shacking with him. But guess what? God still showed up. He showed up with the paralyzed man at the pool of Bethesda. He showed up with the blind man. He sh Jesus went to where people were. God showed up with Jonah when Jonah was in the belly of the whale. He showed up when Lazarus was in a tomb. It's God doesn't just show up when you're in the right place. Grace is when he shows up when you're in the wrong place. Has God showed up for anybody watching me right now? Has God showed up and covered you and protected you? And here's the thing. God will meet you where you are, but he won't leave you where you are. And a lot of times we cannot see. Now the Bible said they didn't recognize his presence. They didn't recognize him. In fact, it's interesting if you look at the text, the text says in Luke chapter 24 and verse 16, let's look at verse uh, 15. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. Listen, in this journey called life, Jesus wants to walk with you. Some folk don't want to walk with you. They don't want to see you. But Jesus wants to walk with you. And the Bible says, but they were kept from recognizing him. Now, I've read what scholars said that God kept them from recognizing him. But you know what? I don't think so. I think the fact that they didn't see God is what happens to many of us. When we're in a dark place, sometimes we just can't see God. And sometimes you don't see God's presence and his work until way afterwards. A year later, five years later, three years later, 10 years later, 20 years later, that accident where that car flipped over three times and you walked away, you said, that was God. When they treated me so unfairly on that job, hard as I work for those people, and they treated me so badly, here you are five years later, you say, that's God, because if I hadn't gotten away from there, I wouldn't be blessed here. You look back, even that difficult, bitter divorce you went through. 
You couldn't see God in it while you were there spending all that money as your marriage was being dissolved and your children were traumatized. But now here you are and you say God was present. God was present even when you had to say goodbye to a loved one. A husband, a wife, a child. And it was so dark, you couldn't see, you couldn't recognize God. You're saying, God, you can't be in this. But here you are 10 years later. You say, that was God right there. And here's what I love about God. He'll meet you wherever you are. And some of us, when you were in some bad places, he found you. When you went to that party and you smoked that joint and drank a pint of Jack, pint of Jack Daniels. And you drove home, and to this day, you don't know how you got home. You could have killed your crazy self and a bunch of other folk, too. But here you are still alive because God covered you. Now, if you're watching me and you've been all holy all your life, God bless you. But if you like some of us, we've been sometimes going the wrong way at the wrong time. And so God showed himself. And then he did something else. He not only showed himself, he shared the word. Look at verse 27. The Bible said that in verse 17, they were downcast. But the Bible says, if you look at verse 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning him. Now watch this. They saw him beaten, whooped, hung like an animal on a cross. They say, I don't get that. If you're from God, you don't get treated like that. Yeah. But the Bible said Jesus went while he was walking with them, that seven-mile journey. The Bible said he did a divine Bible class. Yeah. And he went and went from Moses. Now, he's not talking about the person Moses. He's talking about the books that Moses wrote, because Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And he started with Genesis and showed every book in the Bible was about me. And these were Jews, so they knew the Bible. He said, you remember Adam and Eve? He said, when they sinned, and they sinned against God, and they were hiding from God, and they got those fig leaves to try to cover themselves, you know what that's about? You can't cover yourself and fix your stuff yourself. And you remember what God did? God took the skin of an animal, and he clothed them with it. Jesus said, that's me, that animal that clothe them was innocent that animal did nothing wrong and to clothe the Adam and Eve with the animal skin the animal had to die he said that's me God when I died on that cross that you just saw God took my righteousness and clothed you with it Galatians 3 26 and 27 says we're all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus for as many of you as has been baptized into Christ this is verse 27 has been clothed with Christ we don't wear our clothes that ain't Gucci you wearing you wearing Jesus the righteousness of God from your toes to your head you are clothed with God you are clothed with his righteousness and Jesus told him that he said you remember in Genesis 22 when Abraham took his son Isaac that was Abraham's only son that was his only begotten son and as a father he offered up his son he said that's what my father did he said but I'm gonna tell you something else when he brought the wood up to the sacrifice God provided the sacrifice. Abraham provided the wood, but God provided the sacrifice because he provided a ram in the thicket so that he wouldn't have to kill his own son. He said, guess what? That's what happened on the cross. The Romans and the Jews provided the wood, but God provided the sacrifice. He said, don't you remember when the, your ancestors were slaves in Egypt? And Pharaoh said, I'm not going to let them go. And I told Pharaoh, oh, you're going to let them go because they don't belong to you. They belong to me. And, he, and God said, I'm going to send a death angel to send death, but I want to cover my people. I want to protect my people. You remember what he told him? Now, this is Jesus talking to these people on, on the road. And he said, every family, get a lamb. Get a young lamb. Get a young male lamb. 
Get a young male lamb without blemish. And then between three and six o'clock in the evening, take him on the outskirts of the city. Wound him and kill him and take the blood from that young male lamb without blemish. And I want you to put it on the doorpost. And when the death angel comes, the death angel is going to look for the blood. He's going to say, guys, that was me. A young lamb. You wondering why I didn't say anything when they were spitting on me and they were talking about me? Because lambs don't talk. Lambs don't defend themselves. Lambs don't bite. They just go on willingly. He said, that was me. He said, you remember in Exodus chapter 15 when the Jews were leaving Egypt and you remember they needed water because they were in the desert and they came up on a place that had bitter water. You remember what God told Moses to do? He said, get a piece of wood, throw it in the bitter water. And the Bible says the bitter water became sweet. He said, that's what the cross does. When you take the wood of the cross, compassion, love, commitment, and when the waters of life get bitter for you, just throw the cross in it. And God will turn what's bitter and make it sweet. He said he went through every book of the Old Testament. He said, you remember the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they were thrown in the fiery furnace. For that commitment to God. He said, don't you remember that old King Nebuchadnezzar when they went into the fire? He looked and he said, we threw three in, but I see a fourth man. He said, that fourth man was me. I'm all through this book. You remember Nehemiah when he left the palace and he left the palace to come to Jerusalem because Satan had crushed and crashed and dis dissolved and, and destroyed the walls that had been built up and Nehemiah did a rebuild and a restoration of Jerusalem and he rebuilt everything that the devil has torn down. That's me. I've come to rebuild what the devil has destroyed in your life. Your family, your relationships, your community, your hopes, your dreams. I'm a rebuilding God. And he walked these guys all the way through the Bible. And he shared the word. I want to say to somebody watching me, though, everything that happens in your life, you need to see it through the lens of God's word. You got to see it the way God sees it. And then he did something else. He showed his wound. Look at chapter 24. And the Bible said, he walked with them that whole seven miles. Oh, I love Jesus. He walked that whole seven miles. See, sometimes when you're walking through some, some folk that was with you on mile two, when you get to mile three, they say, find me. And then you walk two more miles. But thank God he walked all seven miles. And let me tell you, just like all seven days of the week, walk with Jesus all seven days of the week. Meditate on him on Monday. Trust him on Tuesday. Work with him on Wednesday. Testify about him on Thursday. Follow him on Friday. You still saved on Saturday and shout for joy on Sunday. Seven days a week, seven miles. And the Bible says when they got there to uh, Emmaus and Emmaus, in a sense, represents what they were comfortable with. Yeah. Remember, they were distraught. They were discouraged. And when Jesus was in Jerusalem, he called disciples out of all these cities. But when they were discouraged and they felt like God had let them down, they went back to where they came from. And, you know, sometimes in life, when we get discouraged, we find ourselves going back to where God brought us out from. That's part of what happens. We, we're so distraught, so discouraged, we go back to drug abuse. We go back to alcoholism. We, 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 we go back to a lifestyle of uh, criminality. We go back to a toxic relationship, even though it was abusive and the person hurt us, but, but that's what we're comfortable with. The word Emmaus means warm springs. It means comfort. And sometimes we go back to what's comfortable, even when it's bad for us. 
So they actually made it there. But Jesus changed the landscape. The Bible said that when they got there, the Bible said they sit down in verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were open and they recognized him. But wait a minute. He had been walking with them seven miles. He has shared the word. He has showed his presence. Why is it that when they ate the food, they recognized him? Here is the reason. Everybody wore robes back then. And the robes kind of like this suit coat. It came and it covered uh, a large power part of the wrist and the hands. When they sat down to eat, the way they would eat, they would give the food like this. When they would give the food out like this, the sleeves would come up. And when Jesus did that, they saw his wounds. If you want folk to really believe that you know Jesus, don't show them your new car. Don't show them your new house. Show them your scars. Show them your scars. Your scars show you've been hurt, but they also show that you've been healed. God said, I can change your scars into stars. In fact, in the book of Philippians, that's what God said in Philippians 2. He said, I will make you star. I've told the story before. When I was seven years old, we were playing ball. And back then, it was six of us, so we didn't have to go get a team. We were a team. We'd get that and a couple of our cousins. I don't know if any of you came from big families. So we were playing ball. <clears throat> I'll never forget. I was seven years old. Seven years old. And, and the ball got stuck in the tree. So we were throwing stuff up in the tree to get the ball out. And I picked up a piece of wood that had a rusty nail. And I threw that piece of wood, but that nail caught my finger. And right now, I have a scar. That, that nail ripped my finger to the bone. I'll never forget it. And I was screaming, and I was hollering, and I could see the white part of my, my meat. And somebody got my mama. Thank God for my mama. My mama came in there and called and got my daddy, and everybody came running. Blood was everywhere. <clears throat> and you know what they did? The first thing they did, they ran it under some water to clean it up clean up the wound. And then they got, I didn't go to a doctor. They wrapped around, she put a bandage around it that I wore for, for several weeks and, that, and it healed. Now, if you look at my hand right now, I don't know if you can tell by watching me, but I still have a scar. That's a 60 year old scar. And it shows that I was hurt, but it also shows that I was healed. And it, I think as Christians, we need to be authentic. Stop pretending that we've had these perfect little lives with perfect little families, act like everything is okay, that we ain't got no issues and ain't all jacked up. All of us are jacked up. All of us got scars. And when it comes, don't get up pretending to people, I got it all together, I've been holy all my life. Let folk know, I come from a jacked up dysfunctional family. My parents may have loved me, my grandparents may have loved me, but they weren't perfect people. They made mistakes. And I'm saying, let people know that, but let people know I was hurt, I was abused, something bad happened to me, I may have even done some things, but God has healed me. Show them your wounds. And it was when he, sh it wasn't his appearance, it wasn't him sharing the word. It is when they saw the wounds. Some things, it is best not when it is explained, it is best when it is experienced. Show them your wounds. But let's finish up though. Something happened. And once he did that, the text says in verse 33, they got up. I like that they got up and returned at once. You know what they did? They did a U-turn. I don't know about you, but thank God for U-turns. You know, a U-turn is when you go in one direction and you make a U-turn and you go back. They got up and went back to Jerusalem because that's where the church was going to get started. Thank God for U-turn. Jacob made a U-turn. David made a U-turn. Paul made a U-turn. He was on his way to Damascus to persecute Christians, and he wound up being a Christian. 
and then went back to Jerusalem. Peter made a U-turn, and here in this text, Cleophas made a U-turn. Thank God for U-turns. And you know, sometimes we're waiting for other folk to turn around. I'm waiting on my husband to turn around. I'm waiting on my children to turn around. I'm waiting on my wife to turn around. I'm waiting on my boss to turn around. But a U-turn means you turn around. It's you. It's you. Make that turn. Make that turn. God wants us to make the turn. On Saturday, instead of preparing to go to the club, start preparing to go to church. Instead of smoking a joint, start singing about Jesus. Amen. I'm going to say amen all by myself on that one. Yeah, yeah. You make the turn. You make the turn. And instead of living a life holding a grudge, have a heart of gratitude. Make the turn. And then, there are four openings in this text. It started off with the tomb being open. And then the Bible said their eyes were open. And then the scripture was open. And then the Bible said their heart was open. Before we close, I want to show you one interesting thing in here. You know, the Bible said that when they went back to Jerusalem in chapter 24 of uh, Luke, and then in verse 36, the Bible says they found the disciples. Now, here's what's interesting. And this is verses 36, 37. Here's what's interesting. <laughs> this is, I, I think it's, it's poignant. Now, when they, these two had gotten so discouraged that they left Jerusalem, that place of blessing, that place of mercy, the place of compassion. And because they were discouraged, they didn't see God in their troubles. And they left and they started going back to where they came from. But then God appeared to them and they turned around. When they got back to Jerusalem, guess who they found? They found the disciples in a house locked up, scared, with the doors locked in. And I'm going to ask you, which is worse, people who leave the church or people who stay in church with their hearts all locked up? Which is worse? Locked up with bitterness and anger and fear. And you know what? They weren't locked out. They had locked themselves in. And sometimes we lock our heart. You in church. You didn't leave Jerusalem. You didn't leave the church. You sitting there every Sunday. But your heart is locked in with jealousy and envy and bitterness and fear. And then the Bible said, though, you know what Jesus did? You know what Jesus did? The Bible said Jesus walked right through the door. And let me tell you, all that stuff that you've got on your heart to lock folk out and lock Jesus out, Jesus said, I will walk right through it because I love you so much. And then what he will do then is then take your hand and pull you through it. Now watch it. Jesus said, I walk through it because I can get you through it because I've got blessings for you. And so, here's the question. The question is this. Do you want Jesus to have to walk through all the stuff in your heart? Or do you want to open the door willingly for Jesus? You know, Jesus is calling right now for you to open the door. He wants to walk with you. Some of you are hurting right now because there are some people who walked away from you. Jesus wants to walk with you. You know, nearly every week I'm going to a funeral. And yes, in fact, yesterday I went to uh, the funeral of, of Brother White's father. He lived to be almost 100 years old. Because, you know, as you walk through, the text talked about the seven miles of this life, which represents your whole life. There will come a day when you will put your head on that dying pillow yep. and you're going to have to walk. You will have to walk yes. the last mile of the way. If I walk in the pathway of duty and if I work In all of his beauty. Yeah, 
Yes. When I'm gone, the last mile of the way, oh Lord. When I've gone, the last mile of the way, yeah. I shall rest at the close. I love that song because sometimes in life it looks like you can't take another step and you're making your last step the last mile of the way but Jesus said I will never leave you nor forsake you I love what he said in Matthew 28 be sure of this that I am with you always even to the end and wherever you are, Jesus said, I'll meet you there. Are you discouraged? Jesus said, I'll meet you there. Are you filled with anxiety and worry? Jesus said, I'll meet you there, but I won't leave you there. Just take my hand. And I'm calling on somebody right now to take the hand of the Lord. You are tired. You're worn out. You don't have no more energy. But Jesus said, take my hand and you can take another step, one step at a time. And we're going to do this thing and we're going to make it through it. Uh, put your prayer request in. We are going to pray for you right now as you walk this journey, as we go the last mile of the way. Oh, Sing that for me. We're going to pray. Gone, the last mile. time prayer time and if you're at home right now I'm gonna ask wherever you are let's just stand in honor of our God the one if we are gonna make it at all it's God that's gonna get us through and let's talk to him right now and ask him to help us as we walk this journey called life father we love you and we love you because while we were yet sinners 
going the wrong way with the wrong people at the wrong time that's when you came to us and you died for us thank you father and thank you for walking with us on this journey called life some of us have gotten on some wrong roads we've gotten off at the wrong time we've run some stoplights and we stopped when we had a green light some of us have had some accidents we've we've run into some issues and run into people that people have hurt us and we've hurt them sometimes the journey has been dark where we couldn't see our way but father you never abandoned us there are times when we were confused and no we didn't know which way to turn in fact we didn't even know who to turn to but you reminded us that you were right there the whole time thank you, and we say thank you Jesus so father right now somebody on this journey is struggling perhaps with sickness right now facing surgery a biopsy go with them we're praying father that they will remember that you will be with them every time they go to the doctor Thank you, Lord. every time they go under the opera go to the operating room you are right there in the room with the doctor the radiologist the anesthesiologist you are right there in that room with the surgeon you. you're the master surgeon Thank you. And so, Father, help us to know you are always present, even when we are walking that road to Emmaus. Thank you for allowing us to make a U-turn. When we were going the wrong way, at the wrong time, you brought us back home. And Father, right now, we are calling on somebody who's walking away from Jerusalem, that place of peace, of mercy and grace, to come back to Jerusalem where the presence and the power and the purpose and the plan of God is is in Jerusalem in a relationship with you in Jesus name we offer this prayer let all that believe say amen If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I labor to the toll of the day, oh Lord, I shall meet the great King in all of his beauty. I shall rest at 
the close of the day. And the close of the day. For I 